in the meantime. But, um, so we're in Daniel 11 and I kind of, you know, like there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of Bible studies I've seen, you know, like where you get to Daniel 11 and they just kind of like blaze through like this chapter and, um, and it's, it's easy not to remember anything from it, you know. I don't, you know, like, don't ask me too many details even after this, but at least we can kind of like play it a little bit like a movie so that it's kind of like that you can see the entire um, story there. And there's actually, um, the more I dig into it, the more interesting it gets. Because um, this, this is a big part of uh, Jewish history. Um, and you know, it's the the book of uh, first and second Maccabees third Maccabees are, are about this. Um, and then you have, um, of course, Josephus's account. Um, but, it, um, and there's one story that I'm actually going to, um, uh, bring out from second Maccabees because, um, it is going to set up something that, uh, I've been seeing in Daniel altogether. I, Cause a lot of times you just hear about Antiochus fourth epiphanies rolling in and destroying jerusalem and i start and we kind of like started seeing that that doesn't just happen in a vacuum in other words there's there had to been something up some kind of corruption in the temple for that to even happen um you don't have people going into you don't have the the jews going into exile or jerusalem being destroyed or uh the temple being desecrated unless there is um, a judgment involved. And um, and there's a, a story that we're going to get into. We're going to go get up to the arrival of Antiochus for Epiphanes uh, today. But here's just kind of like a map of the two empires or the two parts of the Greek empire that we've um, been concentrating on. This is, this is like an old map. I know it's stretched out. But up here, you have the Northern Kingdom, which is the Seleucids. And down here, you have the Ptolemies, which is based out of Egypt. And they are two parts of the Greek Empire after, um, after uh, Alexander the Great had, you know, united the Greeks and, and run and, and built uh, this huge empire. After him, it got split up. Basically, it ended up being split into four parts. Um, and Daniel 11 goes into that and it actually tells you prophetically what's going to happen. And it did happen. And then he, it, then the focus comes on two kingdoms. And Daniel calls it a northern kingdom and he calls it a southern kingdom. So these are the two uh, kingdoms that we're talking about. Down in the south here, the Ptolemy up here, Seleucus. Um, there's two other, you know, parts of the empire that's Lysimachus and Cassander. Um, but there's really nothing in Daniel seven that's said about that. The reason of course being is that this is where, um, of course, Israel is. And, um, and what happens is that the Seleucids and Ptolemies end up fighting over this a lot. Um, they, it, if you, if you think about the port in Joppa, that's, you know, the same port that, you know, you hear mentioned in the Bible a lot of times. Um, it's It became the main port um, for that part of the world because of its location. If you're coming from Africa, you're going to go through, um, uh, you're going to go through uh, uh, Jerusalem, right? Or that area, Judea. Or if you're coming from south, going down into Africa. Also, if you're going, uh, if you're going to cross the Mediterranean and you're going to take a, a port, um, down here in the in it's marshy and it was difficult to to have a port especially like if you're you're thinking about like the delta being over here you know you're, there's once you you could find a, a place to port but then you'd have to cross a lot of water you know to to get very far and of course so you know the sinai peninsula and going into here is very strategic when you get up here to the areas of modern day turkey and everything then you have a lot of cliffs and so for a long time, you know, um, Jerusalem was at the, the center of the trading world there. And there was like a, a lot of dispute over uh, the control of Jerusalem. Where, where Ptolemy is, is that where Egypt now? 
Yes, exactly. The Ptolemy, in fact, they were called pharaohs. Um, they're not related to the, they're not exactly related to the same pharaohs that were, you know, in the Old Testament. Um, but they were, they held that title as a pharaoh. So um, the, the, um, down here, of course, you know, you have Alexandria in Egypt, but Alexandria was a city that was, uh, of course, named after Alexander the Great, because Alexander the Great conquered all of this territory going down into Egypt, and then, um, and then Ptolemy was ruling from Alexandria, basically, and he built a library there, and actually had the Jews, uh, the Ptolemy II had a library there, and he actually had the Jews um, contribute to that library by um, translating the Bible into Greek, uh, which we know is the Septuagint. And um, uh, the Septuagint became such a standard version that everything that, that we read in the New Testament that's quoted from the Old Testament is quoted from the Septuagint. It's not quoted from um, Hebrews. It's quoted from the Greek uh, version of the Old Testament. So that was a very important work there. Wow. We're, we're actually going to cover Seleucids uh, too, um, very early on in the story. And you know, I'm not going to remember all of this, but you know, just to kind of like see how these overlap. Of course, on the south, they're all going to, all of the kings in the south are going to be called Ptolemy. So there's going to be just one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, you know. Here in the north, you're going to have Seleucus, um, and then some of them are going to be Antiochus. And so they kind of take turns. Seleucus first, Antiochus first, Seleucus second, Seleucus third, and then Antiochus third, Seleucus fourth. And then we're going to get all the way down to Antiochus fourth. And that's going to be the one who um, desecrates the temple. What's so, Alexander the Great? What was he called in the Bible? Um, he was called, uh, well, in, in Daniel... Alexander the Great is depicted in Daniel eight as the goat um, that comes from the uh, from the from the east. So there's a vision that Daniel has, and he sees a a ram and a goat, and um, but that goat is um, has a long horn on it. That so that goat is Greece, and so he's called the long horn in Daniel eight, and then in this chapter he's uh, called you know like a, um, a king you know, that that's going to be unstoppable. So the, the first part of uh, Daniel 11 just kind of fast forwards through uh, Xerxes and then goes to Alexander and then uh, and then it gets into the divided kingdom really quickly and then concentrates just on the Ptolemies and Seleucids and what's going on there. So it's kind of like fast forwards really quick, quickly um, past the, the, the Persian kings or to the to the to Xerxes, then it, and then fast slows down a little bit and then gets to these kings right here and then it slows down even more and then and starts getting into um the details about antiochus so this time we're gonna we'll get up to antiochus but we'll uh, but we'll kind of concentrate mostly on these kings right here i got a quick question uh, mm -hmm. on those names mm -hmm. um uh alexander the great when he passed away mm -hmm. uh, I, I understand that his four generals yeah. split up his empire. Right. Are those part of the names? Or is yes. Like yeah. Names so, the but you had Ptolemy, okay. you had Seleucus, uh, Lysimachus, and Cassander. There was one who had tried to keep the 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 kingdom united, um, and uh, and he's named Antigonus. Um, and what happened was that. Seleucus and Ptolemy actually ganged up together to uh, to defeat Antigonus. So there were five originally, um, but they kind of took care of Antigonus uh, quickly. And these two kind of ganged up on Antigonus, got rid of him, and then but then right away started fighting each other, especially fighting each other over Israel. So after some years, Antiochus II, so we're here at Antiochus II, this uh, uh, sort of like this area right here, but we're um, we're we're actually looking at the end of um, Antiochus this is second and Ptolemy second. They'll make an alliance. So what happens is that like even though they're enemies with each other, they they I know I'm just kind of recapping this real quick because this is where 
you have that agreement <clears throat> with this uh this marriage right this is kind of like a soap opera some of this they'll make an alliance and they made it in 250 bc and the daughter of the king of the south her name is berenice shall come to the king of the north who's antiochus the second they make an agreement so what happens under this agreement is that okay the king of the south sends his daughter to marry the king of the north the king of the north divorces his wife laodice um and um and he disowns his son in order so that like the new bride that he has the new wife that he has when she has a son that her son will be able to be the heir of his throne that way you have the king of the south with a relative who's ruling up north and that's how they're going to keep this agreement right but the problem is, is that as soon as the king of the south dies, what happens is that the king of the north divorced that wife, Berenice, and he remarried his old wife, um, Laodice. And Leo, so they're back together again, but Laodice now doesn't trust what's going on. She actually has, she poisons her husband. Huh. And, um, and after she poisons her husband, um, she also goes after uh, Berenice, um, the, the woman that had had been married to her husband, and has her and her son killed because she's going to make sure that her son is going to be the next um, king in the north. Right. And he is the next king of the north. Interesting. So actually, this is a, a painting right here of uh, Antiochus the second. Um, he, um, he, during the, the making of the, uh, the Septuagint and here's the, the Jews explaining the Septuagint to him and he's going to put it in the, in the library in Alexandria and Egypt, Egypt, you'll see the pyramids back here or whatever. It's a artistic uh, portrayal of that period of time. It doesn't mention it here in Daniel, but that's one of the things that, that happened under, on his watch, you know. So she, Berenice, shall not retain the strength of her arm, and he, Seleucus, too, and his arm shall not endure, but she shall be given up and her attendants, he who fathered her, Ptolemy II, and he who supported her. So Ptolemy II dies, Laodice doesn't trust her husband, she has, she has all these people killed, and um, Seleucus II, that's how he takes the throne, or actually retains his um, uh, rightful heir heirdom to that throne actually and from a branch from her roots so we're talking again again about Laodice by the way if you, if Laodice sounds familiar it's because this town of Laodicea is named after uh, uh, maybe her or another Laodice um, that's how you get the name uh, Laodicea and from a branch from her roots so it's not one of her kids but it's going to be her brother right a branch from her roots, one shall arise. His name's uh, Ptolemy II. Um, he, shall, he shall come against the armor and enter the fortress of the king of the north, and he shall deal with them and prevail. So what this verse is about is that Bernice's brother, so this is all, this is all prophesied, and this is how the, the second parts, uh, the ones in, ita in italics, those are the verses, and I'm just going one verse at a time. And then whatever have written underneath it is what actually happened in history that we know now. Okay, so Bernice's brother, Ptolemy III, took over for their father in the south. And in retaliation for Berenice's death, so he attacked Seleucus II, Laodice's son, and, kill, and killed Laodice. But he didn't end up killing um, uh, um, Seleucus II. So let me go through that again. So her brother, he's mad about, um, he's mad about like his sister's assassination, right? So he comes and he attacks, um, uh, he takes over for his uh, father in the South and he, and he goes and attacks the North, right? He kills Laodice um, and he goes and, he, and he's fighting Laodice's son the one who took over, but he doesn't succeed in killing him. But he does gain a lot of territory in Asia, in Asia Minor. So he does he does manage to get some areas in modern-day Turkey, like way north of uh, 
uh, Jerusalem. He shall also carry off to Egypt their gods and their middle images and their precious vessels of silver and gold. And for some years, he shall refrain from attacking the king of the north. So Ptolemy III, he comes back from uh, Egypt. You know, he's he comes he comes back to the south, back to Alexandria. But he had taken many spoils from the north, including Egyptian holy vessels uh, that Cambyses II had taken in, into Persia way back in 525 BC. So what he did is that um, this is like pretty smart, smart, smart politics, right? He's ruling as part of this Greek empire thing down in the south, but he goes up, um, kicks butt in the north, and he takes off with a, a bunch of treasures that they had taken hundreds of years before from Egypt. So he brings these treasures back to Egypt. And of course, the local people in Egypt, you know, think that I'm sure thought that that was fantastic. You know, he brought some of the ancient um, Egyptian treasures back down to Egypt where they should be. Yeah. So he signs a treaty with Seleucus II in 241, though. So That's there's the a, it's the one he didn't kill. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So he kind of he kind of makes a treaty with him. Then the latter, that's um, Seleucus II, shall come into the realm of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. So two years after this treaty, um, Seleucus um, II goes ahead and invades the south anyway. So he breaks the treaty, it sounds like. But he was forced to retreat. Now, Seleucus II, his sons will wage war, not at the same time, but in succession, those two sons are going to um, wage war and assemble a multitude of great forces, which shall keep coming and overflow and pass through, and again, shall carry the war as far as his fortress. So what happens is Ptolemy IV uh, now took it over his father's expanded empire. So that's in the, uh, that again, in the south. His sons um, in, the, in the north, Seleucus III succeeded his father in the north, and he tried to take back the areas in Asia Minor that his father lost. Because remember, his father had gotten, uh, had lost all these areas, um, you know, like in, um, in Asia Minor. But he died in the process, and then his brother Antiochus III took over. So now we're up to Antiochus III. Antiochus III, he actually goes down and attacks Egypt and took over the area of Israel um, in 217 BC. So and, um, he actually, so now you have um, uh, Israel in the hands of the north now. So up to this point, they've been in the hands of the South. In the hands of the South, they were doing actually pretty good early on. I mean, that's that's when the Septuagint was written, and um, and for the most part, they were allowed to um, they're allowed to practice their faith, and um, and uh, God protected them, and things went well for them, and they um, and it seems at least up until Antiochus the Fourth that they had a good a decent priest, you know, a God fearing priest. Um, then the king of the south, and this is Ptolemy the fourth, moved with rage, um, shall come out and fight against the king of the north. And he, Antiochus the third, shall raise a great army, army, but it shall be given into Ptolemy's hands. So the king of the south is actually going to win this battle. This is Ptolemy the fourth. And when the multitude is taken away, his, his heart shall be exalted. Ptolemy gets a big head after he um uh after he beats the um uh the king of the north and he shall cast down tens of thousands but he shall not prevail in any case for long so what happened is that the same year that ptolemy the fourth attacked the north he retakes israel so it was just for a brief time there that israel was under the um the control of the north this time around right but what happens is that he's so euphoric after after winning back Israel that he spends the rest of his life like in drunken debauchery. He's just partying all the time. And um, and he's also becoming more oppressive. He kind of he's just living in, in the glory days of the past. 
And, um, and now Israel's really getting sick of the Ptolemies because they don't like this guy. All he does is party all the time. He's a drunk and he, um, and he's oppressive, right? So now the king of the north is going to gain a little bit of popularity because the, um, the, the, um, the people who are in the control of the Ptolemies, not just Israel, are going to get sick of this Ptolemy the fourth, right? So the, for the king of the north shall again raise a multitude greater than the first. And after some years, he shall come on with a great army and abundant supplies. So after he loses up in the north, Antiochus IV, he does the smart thing. He actually builds. Now, this is not a good guy, okay? But he is a smart guy. He builds um, his empire over 14 years. What he does is he conquers territory in the east and the north. So he's going up into... Um, He's he's going up into like areas of modern day Iraq um, and um, and I think Iran um, and he's um, and he's going northwards up into uh, modern day Turkey that those areas. Is he, this Alexander? No, this is now this is way past Alexander now. This this is these are the uh, the the offspring of the people who took over for Alexander. Um, oh, yeah. So he passed away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Antiochus the Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he he earns the and some people start calling him Antiochus Antiochus the Great, but is he's Antiochus the Third. He spends fourteen years. He he becomes great because he um you know he earns the epitaph the Great, but he uh, um he's not a great guy at all. He, um, he's just gaining power and he grew in strength while Patar Ptolemy IV is just partying on. He's kind of wasting his life away. Um, and then he comes back and he attacks the South again. So he comes in for a second shot at it. And it says, verse 14, in those times, many shall rise against the king of the South. So like I said, they're going to, they got sick of this Ptolemy down South because he's partying all the time. And it's many shall rise, not just the the is not just the Jews, but the uh, uh, but other people that were under their control. And the violent among your own people, in other words, this is being said to Daniel. So, um, you know, some of the you Hebrews are going to lift yourselves up in order to fulfill the vision, but they shall fail. This is a very difficult verse, and there's a lot of people of uh, different opinions on this. Um, I kind of put down what I think it means, okay? The, the explanation that most satisfied me. So what happens is that in the South, people are getting sick of Ptolemy, his debauchery and oppressive rule. There were political oppositions lost, launched against him. So they're trying, they're attacking him politically. Also, the Jews became divided over who they should be under. So there, some of them are like saying, well, we should be under the Ptolemies. And some of them are saying, well, and, you know, because, because overall the Ptolemies have been pretty good to us. And some are saying, no, the Seleucids is who we need to uh, make an alliance with. And so they're, they're starting to argue and fight amongst themselves who they should be under, right? So many Jews wanted to be out from Ptolemy the fourth, and some assisted. They actually helped out Antiochus III. Um, gain victory over Ptolemy. So they in they inadvertently made the vision come to pass because once Antiochus III gets a stronghold in Israel, it's uh, it's the beginning of their demise. Um, Antiochus the, eventually Antiochus IV is going to come in, and um, and he is going to um, you know wreak havoc there. And so they, they actually, in the same time, they, it seems that they were trying to make Israel a um, independent state. Um, so they failed in making Israel an independent state. And at the same time, they're ushering in who's actually going to be turn out to be the enemy. So that's where I think that it means the violent among your own people, they'll lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision. In other words, this vision that we see but they will fail in the sense that um, they're not going to end up with what they want. That's um, kind of like the best explanation I could find on it, but I'm not really sure what it means. 
So verse 15, then the king of the north shall come and throw up siege works and take a well-fortified city. And the forces of the south shall not stand or even his best troops, for there shall be no strength to stand. So what happens is that in the north, well, okay, in the south, first of all, Ptolemy fourth and his wife, um, so the partier and his wife, they died mysteriously in 203. And their infant son, Ptolemy V, takes over. He's just a baby, but he's the heir, right? So what happens is that Antiochus III, he takes advantage of um, Ptolemy V's inexperience because he's a baby. <laughs> you know, he <laughs> doesn't have experience in anything, literally, you know. And so he besieged and he took Sidon north of Jerusalem in 200 BC. So he's getting close to um, regaining uh, control over Jerusalem. Uh, so you go from a partying, uh, a party animal to his uh, infant son who doesn't know how to rule yet, you know. But he who comes against him shall do as he wills, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land. Of course, the glorious land is Israel, with destruction as a hand. So when Antiochus III had taken over Sidon, he forced the general Scopus to surrender. Three other generals tried to free Scopus from Sidon uh, unsuccessfully. I think Scopus was... Um, Scopus was, I forget who he was uh, associated with or where he came from. I should have written that down. I don't remember. I'm sorry. So Antiochus III continued south to Gaza. So he's gone down to, to Gaza. And when he entered Jerusalem, he receives a hero's welcome as their deliverer. They're calling him the, their, their deliverer. They're calling him a hero. But of course, little, little did they know that, you know, this is the beginning of the end for them, you know. Not the end, but, you know, bad news is coming. So he shall set his face to come with the strength of his whole kingdom, and he shall bring terms of an agreement and, and perform them. He shall give him the daughter of women to destroy the kingdom, but it shall not stand or be to his advantage. So this is what's happening. In the background, of the, all this time, Rome is growing, right? Rome is growing in the background, right? And it's a growing threat. So Antiochus III, he, even though he's fighting against, uh, he fought against Ptolemy IV, he forms an alliance with Ptolemy V, which is weird. I guess you form an alliance with, uh, uh, this must have been years later, um, because he gives his daughter Cleopatra um, the first to Ptolemy V. So this is the first Cleopatra. The Cleopatra you hear about, you know, like later on, is that's Cleopatra, what, the 12th or something? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, the, the one Elizabeth with Mark Taylor. Anthony. Yeah, Elizabeth Taylor. That's that's Cleopatra, the, the 12th. So this is Cleopatra 1. And she becomes um, uh, she becomes the wife to Ptolemy the 5th. And he is kind of thinking now that um, maybe she can betray Ptolemy, right? A kind of the way that, uh, you know, so if he can get his daughter to be betray my own daughter, if I if I can get my own daughter to betray the king of the south, then I'll end up with con in control of the south as well as the north. That's what he's thinking, right? But um, the thing is that she ends up being loyal to her husband and not to her father. And um, so... She was faithful for, to Ptolemy V, and she actually encouraged Ptolemy V to make an alliance with Rome. So now you've got um, the king of the south who has an alliance with Rome, and so Antiochus is starting to get surrounded. This is getting dangerous for him, right? And it's because, and no thanks to his daughter. Afterwards, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall capture many of them. But a commander shall put an end to his insolence. Indeed, he shall turn his insolence back upon him. Then he shall turn his face back to the fortresses of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and shall not be found. It's, it's, it's confusing reading all these verses, when, you know, like in isolation, you know, like that. So 
he's he's angry about you know this alliance that uh, the king of the south is making you know with rome and then rome is taking over areas of greece so antiochus the third tries to drive them out in 192 he took the coastlands in the aegean sea but claudius Scipio drove him out he went back to antioch and died in 187 he died in murder he yeah. Died. Was, yeah. Uh, yeah so um so he's kind of like uh claudius Scipio, of course is a is a roman uh general so so he turns his face to the coastlands and he he cap did capture many of them but a commander that's a commander from rome he'll put an end to his insolence and he'll turn his insolence back on him then he will turn about his faith back towards the fortresses of his own land so he goes back home but he shall stumble and fall and shall not be found in other words he'll die okay um and what happens is that now um it, he actually becomes uh has he owes tribute to rome now um but he dies but now his son is going to end up um, owing tribute to rome this is where things start getting kind of interesting okay then shall arise in his place one who shall send an exactor of tribute so what um for the glory of the kingdom but within a few days he shall be broken neither in anger nor in battle so this is what we're where we're at his son ends up owing rome on behalf of his dead father so antiochus the third's son seleucus the fourth takes over and in order to pay back rome he's going to greatly tax his own people, right? Oh, Including the Jews um, to pay off his father's debt. He heard rumors about this treasure in the temple in Jerusalem, and he sends his prime minister, Heliodorus, that's the exactor of tribute here, in order to collect tribute from the temple. Okay, so now we're getting to like where he, uh, you know, like, this is going to be a desecration to the temple because people have given to the temple. He's taxing, he's, he's taxing, taxing people's tithes. You know, the, the gifts that they've given to the temple and the money that's been raised in a temple for orphans and widows and stuff like this. So this is not cool. Of course, um, the, the priest doesn't like it and God doesn't like it. Okay. Um, so, however, Heliodorus was confronted by a, a quote, divine apparition and he ended up not collecting. This was the way that, like somebody who um, uh, put it right, and I'm and I, and they said we don't know if it's a demonic apparition or if it's a godly apparition. We don't know, but there is a story about it, about Second Maccabees, and this is where we'll um, defer to Second Maccabees. Okay, the, says here. While the holy city was inhabited in unbroken peace and the laws were very well observed because of the piety of the high priest Ananias and his hatred for wickedness, it came about that the kings themselves honored the place and glorified the temple with the finest presence so that even Seleucus, the king of Asia, defrayed from his own revenues all the expenses connected with the services of the sacrifices. Okay. So this priest Ananias here is key because he's a pious, he is a pious priest. He's a good priest. And, um, and the, the laws are being very well observed in Jerusalem up to this point to such a point, to, to such a degree that, um, that it's being claimed here that the, the Kings of the North and themselves, uh, the South actually kind of respected it, you know? And um, they actually um, donated to the temple and those sorts of things. So we saw, remember last week, we saw that story of like Alexander the Great ruling into Jerusalem. And Alexander the Great actually, um, uh, uh, he's going to like, he's going to come there and torture the priest and, and do some bad things to the city. But then he sees that, um, he sees, when he sees the priest, he recognizes him him from a dream that he had or a vision that he had back in Macedonia and go, no, this God confronted me and told me that um, uh, to look out for this priest and, and Alexander the Great has this big change of mind. This is something that Josephus records, but you can, you can check out last week's for that.
so that a man named Simon from the tribe of Benjamin, this is going to be a bad guy, right? This guy named Simon from the tribe of Benjamin, who had been made captain of the temple, had a disagreement with the high priest, Ananias, about the administration of the city market. And when he could not prevail, when he couldn't re uh, win the argument over Ananias, he went to Apollonius of Tarsus, who at that time was the government the governor of Coelestra and Phoenicia. Hey, what's up? <laughs> so, um, so this is the Simon guy, right? It's just think Simon. Um, he reported to him that the treasury in Jerusalem was full of untold sums of money so that the amounts of the funds could not be reckoned. And so what he does is that he tells basically this king that there is a whole bunch of money that can be tapped into in Jerusalem. If you want to get um, money for your taxes, go to Jerusalem and raid the temple, basically get money out of the temple. That's what, the, so this Simon guy is like right off the bat, he's a traitor, right? Yeah. You know, he's, he's supposed to be looking over the temple, but instead, because it gets into a fight with the high priest, he's going to like, um, he, he's going to like spread this rumor that there's all this money that can be extracted by the, by the king. Um, so, and that they did not belong to the account of the sacrifices. In other words, they can't be accounted by just by sacrifices, um, but that it was possible for them to fall under the control of the king. So when Apollonius met with, met the king, he told them of the money about which ha he had been informed by Simon. The king chose Heliodorus. Heliodorus is the guy that the, um, that the king's going to send to get the tribute. Go get that money from the temple. Who was in charge of his affairs, because he was his prime minister, and he sent him with the commands to effect the removal of the aforesaid money. Go get that money. Heliodorus at once set out on his journey, ostensibly to make a tour of inspection of the cities of Coelestra and Phoenicia. So he's going to pretend that he's... He's going to do this inspection of these two other cities. But really, he's just going to go up there and, and try to get the money from um, the temple, right? But in fact, to carry out the king's purpose. So when he arrived at Jerusalem, and he had been kindly welcomed by the high priest, Ananias, um, he told about the disclosure. In other words, he tells Ananias what the king has said and um, stated why he had come, and he inquired whether this was really the situation. So Ananias, the high priest, explained that there were some deposits belonging to widows and orphans, and also some money of Hyrcanus, son of Tobias, a man of very prominent position that had totaled in all 400 talents of silver and 200 uh, of gold. Um, and he's he's saying, yeah, some rich guy donated to the temple, you know, but that's that's something he gave to the Lord, you know, um, and it's 400 talents of silver and 200 of gold. In other words, it's not it's not nearly as much as being as it's being rumored. Right. So this Simon guy is full of it. <laughs> so to an extent, the impious Simon had misrepresented the facts. He said that it was utterly impossible that wrong should be done to those people who had trusted in the holiness of the place and the sanctity of the and viability of the temple, which is honored throughout the whole world. He's saying this is not good because people gave this in good faith that it was going to be used for the Lord's purposes and to help widows and orphans and, and those sorts of things. Um, they didn't give it so that some king could, could rob it and tax it, right? But Heliodorus, because of the king's commands, which he had, said that this money must in any case be confiscated for the king's treasury. So he set a day and went in to di direct the inspection of these funds. So there was no little distress throughout the city. So this stresses the Jerusalem out. The priests prostrated themselves before the altar in their priestly garments and called towards heaven upon him who had given the law about the deposits that he should keep them safe for those who had deposited them. So they're, they're going to humble themselves before the Lord to see the appearance of the high priest who was to be wounded at heart. It was painful to even look at this um, uh, priest for his face and the change of his color disclosed the anguish of his soul for terror and bodily trembling had come over the man, which plainly showed to those who looked at him, 
the pain lodged in his heart. People also hurried out of their houses in crowds to make a general supplication because the holy place was about to be brought into contempt. People are running out of their houses um, and uh, coming to the street, you know, in mourning. Women girded with sackcloth under their breasts thronged the streets. So it looks like they're wearing sackcloth bras or something. I don't know. Some of the maidens were kept indoors. So some of them were vestal virgins, basically. The maidens who were kept indoors ran together to the gates and some to the walls while others peered out of the windows and holding up their hands to heaven, they all made entreaty. There was something pitiable in the prostration of the whole populace and the anxiety of the priest is still in great anguish. The, even this, though this is the RSV version, it's still kind of hard to read sometimes. I was just going to ask you, where are you reading this? This, this is RSV. The King James is even more confusing. You know? And it's written so narratively and not... Um... Not usually how I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, the when you when you see like the introduction in First Maccabees, it's kind of like you guys have all this history available to you. We thought that it would be proper to summarize these events, kind of like in a in a uh, historic. I mean, like in a narrative form that you can. So that's easy. Uh, no, this this is from Second Maccabees. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, this is not the second standard version. Yeah, revised standard version. And I was like, this does not sound like a lot of common Bible. Yeah, RSV is like, usually like a little bit easier than this, but um, uh, but King James, I, I, it was, it was either this or the King James, and the King James was really hard to read. There was something pitiable in in the prostration of the whole populace and the anxiety of the high priest in his great anguish. So while they were calling upon the almighty Lord that he would keep what had been entrusted safe and secure for those who had entrusted it, Heliodorus went on with what he had decided. But when he arrived at the treasury with his bodyguard, then and there the sovereign of spirits and of all authority caused so great a manifestation that all who had been so bold as to accompany him and accompany him were astounded by the power of God and became faint with terror. So he goes to the temple to get this money and, and everything, but he's confronted by uh, God sent somebody basically to, to uh, confront him. Right. For there appeared to them a magnificently capri um, caparisoned horse. I mean, it's like a decorated horse when you decorate a horse. Uh, with a fighter of frightening mien, and it rushed furiously at Heliodorus and struck him with his front hoofs. So this rider and this horse hit hit him, right? Its rider was seen to have armor and weapons of gold, filled with joy and gladness now that the Almighty Lord had appeared. Two young men also appeared to him, remarkably strong, you know, assumably angels of some kind, um, gloriously beautiful and splendidly dressed who stood on each side of him and scourged him continuously inflicting many blows on him so he gets knocked down by a horse and then he's got two guys like whipping him right and then when he suddenly fell to the ground and deep darkness came over him so he probably passed out or something his men took him up and put him on a stretcher and carried him away this man who had just entered the aforesaid treasury with a great retinue and all his bodyguard, but now was unable to help himself. And they recognized clearly the sovereign power of God. While he lay prostrate, speechless because of the div divine intervention and deprived of any hope of recovery, they praised the Lord who had acted marvelously for his own place. So God is going to protect his temple. And the temple, which a little while before was full of fear and disturbance, was filled with joy and gladness now that the Almighty Lord had appeared. So quickly, some of, so, <laughs> you know, they're like, they recognize, yeah, this is not a, a normal event. <laughs> and <laughs> like, <laughs> and the, the, this, uh, the God of this temple is serious about like keeping this place and protecting the investment people have, uh, have made uh, into it, you know? Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So, it, 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 he said, yeah, no, he had more than a vision. This is like something that appeared and all of a sudden he gets attacked by like three angelic beings or something like yeah. that. 
and they kick his butt, you know, and they almost kill him, right? You know, so like this apparition, you know, like which, uh, well, we don't know if it's demonic or no, it wasn't demonic. It's like not, well, at least not according to Maccabees, you know. So, um, so what happens is this, this, this priest is actually going to end up praying for Heliodorus. So quickly, some of Heliodorus's friends asked Onias to call upon the Most High and to grant life to the one who was lying quiet at his last breath or quite as at his last breath. So he's about to die, and they're, they're asking now for the priest to pray for him. And the high priest, fearing that the king might get the notion that some foul play had been perpetrated by the Jews with regard to Heliodorus, offered sacrifice for the man's recovery. So what he's thinking is like the, the priest is thinking, if this Heliodorus dies and the word comes back to the king, they're going to think that we killed him. So that there was some kind of foul play, right? And, you know, like, yeah, sense. like we're going to try to explain to the king that like some writer appeared out of nowhere and some and some angels started whipping him. And that's why this Heliodorus guy is dead. I don't think that king's going <laughs> to buy that. You know, he's, he's going to. So he starts actually praying that like this guy not die. Right. I think he's learned his lesson anyway. You know, so while the while the high priest was making the uh, offering of atonement, the same young men appeared again to Heliodorus. So the same guy who had whipped Heliodorus now reappeared to him dressed in the same clothing. And they stood and they said, be very grateful to Anias, the high priest, since for his sake, uh, Anais, because of Anias's prayer, basically, the Lord has granted you your life. In other words, uh, because it would turn out bad for Anais if you actually died, I'm going to save your life to, to you know, like uh, save that king from thinking Anais had this guy killed or something, right? So, but just be thankful for that because I'm not saving you for you. Um, I'm saving you because of Anais's, uh, for Anais's sake. And see, See that you who have been scourged by heaven report to all men the majestic power of God. Having said this, they vanished. So they said, tell the story of what happened to you. <laughs> so the conversion of Heliodorus. Then Heliodorus offered sacrifice to the Lord and made very great vows to the Savior of his life. And having bidden Onias farewell, he marched off with his forces to the king. And he bore testimony to all men of the deeds of the supreme God, which he had seen with his own eyes. When the king asked Heliodorus what sort of person would be suitable to send on another mission to, the, to Jerusalem. So now he's like, Heliodorus comes back, but the king's like, well, who can I send to actually get the tribute now? Uh, Heliodorus says, if you have an enemy or a plotter against your government, send him there. In other words, if there's somebody you don't like, send them because they're going to end up getting walloped just like I did. Right. And they're going to end up getting killed for you will get him back thoroughly scourged if he escapes at all. For there certainly is about the place some power of God for he who has his dwelling in heaven watches over that place himself and brings it aid. And he strikes strikes and destroys those who come and do it injury. This was the outcome of the episode of Heliodorus and the protection of the treasury. The reason that this is such a key story in the Maccabees, I think, is because you have this in contrast with, um, with Antiochus Epiphanes coming in and then ransacking the town. Why didn't God protect them then? Because here it's made clear that God is into protecting his temple. Yeah. And it's the same high priest, basically, that gets removed, Onias. So this isn't much later that Antiochus IV comes in. Um, and now you've got, you've got like this whole situation in Jerusalem. And the thing is, is that um, in the Maccabees, in 1 Maccabees, it goes on to explain that. They, they basically go on to explain that if... Um, because of what the Jews were doing and how their heart had been turning away from the Lord and how they had been adopting Hellenism and wanting to live just like the Greeks did and everything. And, and all of this corruption that was going on and they got, they, they got Anias removed and um, now they got like a face, fake priesthood. 
Uh, all those things were building up. Like I said, God doesn't let his temple get um, ransacked for no reason. There's judgment involved. And it had to. And so um, the book of Maccab the books of Maccabees are um, they um, they see it that way. They're like, this happened to Heliodorus. And it says that explicitly. If if they had if they had kept with the Lord, the same thing that happened to Heliodorus would have happened to Antiochus Epiphanes and worse. You know, that's, um, here's actually a painting of, um, Heliodorus and this, this whole incident. This is a, this is a painting done by Raphael back in the early 1500s. Um, so you see Onias, the high priest there, there's the menorah. Um, here's the, you know, like they're in the temple, um, you have like these kids and uh, that's supposed to be the orphans and widows. Um, you have the rider on his horse trampling him. And then you've got like these young men with like the whips, you know? And so it's, it's, I think it's called the sc scourging of Heliodorus or something like that. You know? Yeah. It's in the Vatican. This painting it's, it's done by Raphael. So I was curious as to what his name meant. I knew that Helio was his son. Oh, right. Or is his Heliodorus. Name? Yeah, I don't know it's what gift of the sun. I looked it up. Oh, gift of the sun. Okay. Yeah. It's second Maccabees. Second Maccabees three. Um. Yeah. So, so second Maccabees. Um, the Maccabees are where you get their. Uh, the the stories in there is kind of like in the the ransacking of the the temple the 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 revolt that happens after that it's all the story behind um hanukkah so you know it's a rededication of the temple this is the word Heliod, heliodorus is like right before antiochus epiphanies oh, and hanukkah is about hanukkah is about the the next guy after him or the next guy after the king that sends this guy you know mm -hmm. so you're going to go from Seleucus the third to Antiochus the fourth, I think. And and yeah. So wait, Seleucus said sent Heliodorus or not? Yeah. So so Seleucus the third, his his father had like lost uh, a battle against the Romans, and now he was he owed tribute to the Romans, but he uh, dies, and now his son's got to come up with that tribute. So his his uh, his uh, son tries to get all this money from everywhere, including the temple. And he sells, sends this Heliodorus, this uh, prime minister, um, to go and go get that money from the temple. You know, they're hiding a bunch of money. Go get it from them. And um, and it was based on a rumor that, like, somebody who got into an argument with the high priest spread that rumor around. Oh, they're, they, they're keeping all these untold treasures in the temple over there. So that's... Uh, um, of course, this high priest says, "No, those that money doesn't belong to anybody but the but but the Lord, and um and it's way less money than you were told, anyway, you know." And so Heliodorus basically gets, uh, you know, he he basically gets put in this place, and then go tell your king that like I'm having none of this, you know. So he ended up not um he ended up not taxing them. So yeah, he, he ended up not taxing whatever the the story is around that. Um, he he ended up not taxing them apparently. I think it's weird how that painting, like he's down in the corner, uh -huh. like and not in the center, you know. Oh, uh, where? Like, oh yeah, yeah. So it's it's broken. It's kind of like it's broken up into two parts so that you can it it can tell the story, you know. Yeah. And it's weird here because you have the you have the Pope at the time. Um, who is Julius the second, um, kind of like watching all of this happen. And then Raphael, I think this is Raphael himself paints himself into this picture, but they're watching it happen. Anais is praying. And then like, this is happening over here. Oh, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, you had to kind of tell a story in a painting and then add, add in a bunch of emblematic things just or whatever, you know, you know. So in his place, so um, this is um, Seleucus uh, the fourth. Sorry, um, 
So Lucas for the fourth who just sent this Helios guy. In his place shall arise a contemptible person. This is this is who we're getting where we're getting go, gonna get to Antiochus the fourth. Um to whom royal majesty had not been given. He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So he's he's the brother of the king. He's not the son. So he's not a rightful heir. Antiochus IV had been in Rome in prison. Um, he's basically a political prisoner, I guess, you know. But he weaseled his way to the throne. So Seleucus IV actually had two sons who should have been his heirs, but the oldest... His oldest son was in prison in Rome, so he's kind of being held up. His name's Demetrius. And then Heliodorus, the tax collector, he ended up, um, he's still a weasel, by the way. He uh, he, he, he um, seized the throne supposedly in the name of the younger brother Antiochus. So he kind of like, he kind of like sees an opp opportunity. You got like the younger brother who is in that experience. You got the older brother in prison in Rome. Heliodorus kind of comes back and he's like, okay, the king's dead. I'm going to like, I'm going to rule on behalf of the younger son. You know, I'll be his help, you know, or whatever, you know, to kind of weasels his way. And then Antiochus IV does the same thing. Um, but he goes in the name of Demetrius. So you got two guys weaseling the, the, the throne instead of the sons. Um, but but what happens is that um, uh, Antiochus the fourth is is stronger and Heliodorus um, he, he takes he, yeah, he takes off he flees. So that's how Antiochus the fourth ends up um, with the throne. And next week we'll get into um, Antiochus Epiphany's story because that's when things get really ugly. So, so all this time the temple is amazing confused now. Look at it. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, you're like that was a lot of history. I know it's a long. You know, it's like, uh, uh, yeah. I the the I think one of the main things though is just to see you know like if for la last week you know mm -hmm. that story with uh, uh you know, there's there's this prevail um prevailing view within Judaism. And Second Temple Judy, um, Jewish literature, like the Maccabees, and you know, even the way that Josephus writes, that you know, you don't just stroll into God's temple and take over it, even if you are the strongest king around, right? <coughs> that God's not going to hand His people and His temple over to you unless there's something wrong going on in Jerusalem and the temple itself. And that's kind of like one of the things that's sort of been overlooked in the the story of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, and um, and I and a lot of times the way that the story has been portrayed is just like you've had Antiochus Epiphanes, this bad guy, stroll into Jerusalem, desecrate the temple, but then the Jews her heroically want it back. Right? There's a lot more to it than that. And when you read Maccabees and you read Josephus. You're like that didn't happen because everything was kosher in Jerusalem. That's there's something going on, and the same thing that and and Daniel is forming this pattern that the same thing with any kind of future antichrist is going to be the same thing. Paul says it himself. We know that the apostasy happens first, and it's because of this apostasy. In other words, if you have you know if you if you have like a godly nation or a godly people or a, a godly community, godly church, whatever, you know that like God is going to um, protect them, you know, that there's going to be uh, that that's kind of like, that's that's kind of like the thing that's being communicated. So there's something severely wrong um, when um, something like this happens. So I think that it has something to do with the apostasy that um uh you know in the future and i don't know if it's the church or whatever else um you but it's gonna happen like before they were gonna yeah happen? and and i think about just like the things that are happening just in our country today of course you know it's kind of like um the more that we've that we've said oh okay we'll we'll open the door and we'll say this is okay and that's okay and we'll just kind of like we'll we'll just compromise and compromise and compromise well 
eventually it's going to end up in a situation where Christians themselves are going to be persecuted. You know, you can see that Sorry, you can yeah. you can see that like you can see the the seeds of that taking place. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like yeah, you want to yeah. you want to sell out a society to to more and more sin and more and more like decrepit things, then expect to be in the end um, persecuted um, as Christians. Like how they were with the, the Greek stuff. Right yeah, there, like, like, yeah, that. that and that's what we're gonna see because I'm I am gonna draw more on the on the Maccabees um, because they. They 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 set a description of the way things were. Uh, their society was just um, uh, crumbling, and and how they were they were like becoming more and more Greek in their ways, and they were abandoning um, God's laws, and they were just they were inviting this on themselves in a way. So God handed them over to it basically, and that's that's kind of like what what you um, what you see. They didn't end up in Babylon. Because out of nowhere, either you know, God handed them over. Is this when they came back from Babylon? Or yeah, this is already when they've come back to Babylon. Ezra and Nehemiah, they you know, like a, the temple's been, been rebuilt. So this is all Second Temple period, right? right. This is all. This is only like a couple hundred, 150 to a couple hundred years before, um, before Christ. So we're like because we're we're getting right up to the Roman Empire at this point. So what's going to happen is that like. After Antiochus Epiphanes, then you're going to have this. Um, uh, you're going to have the, the. You're going to have relative peace in Jerusalem um, until the Romans. You know. So, but for like a hundred years, they're going to be pretty good after that. Uh, after that incident, you know. So, um, and of course, this is going to be pretty fresh in the minds of the uh, of the people in Jesus's day. In fact, Jesus went to the the temple of uh, the the festival of re, uh, rededication as well. It's something he attended, like the early form of Hanukkah. You know, um, this it, it mentioned it's I forget where it mentions it, but um, but Jesus did participate though because he's Jewish. You know, it's like um, but there's so many so many things here too that remind you of like the story in Esther. You know. Uh, people like uh, praying to God when uh, when things are, are are going really bad and things are going to happen to them and destruction and then um, God coming in and protecting them and everything and turning things on their head. So, so. Solomon built the temple. They get exiled. The temple gets destroyed when they get exiled. Yeah, the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And then uh, Darius or one of the Darius does um, let him build. Sire, a, Cyrus. Cyrus gives a decree, says, you know, um, I'm in charge now and you guys are allowed to go back and build the temple. But while Cyrus is off fighting his wars and everything, his son is not that great. Um, and so there's a lot of political um, uh, opposition, which is why Daniel um, is 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 like praying and, and making supplications to God saying, mm. this is not going very easily. We're supposed to be able to go back and rebuild the temple. What, what's going on, Lord? You know, because there's there's a lot of um, satanic kind of like um, opposition against us. You know, it's what he has to be thinking. And there was. And God's, and what about the 70 years? You know, and, and God's like, you know what? 70 times 70 years are, well, okay, so I'm mixing stories up. First, before this all happens, Daniel starts, you know, like praying about the seven years. But um, but even like when it was happening and everything, you know, and like even under Cyrus, um, you know, like uh, he's still fasting and praying and, and um, you know, wearing sackcloth or do doing whatever, you know, just saying, you know, pleading. And I, I because Daniel has a burden, you know, like I said, you know, there was a, a burden given to him. That's when, you know, like, uh, and Daniel's finding out that he's part of spiritual warfare because um, the messenger who's dispatched him says, I've been held up for, for 21 days, but I, you know, your, per your prayer was heard on day one, but uh, it's been a struggle to even get here and give you this message, like you know? Visual, yeah. So, so then they come back, Nehemiah rebuilds the temple. Yeah. And we're in this period right here. Like where you just read from the Maccabees. Yeah. And then it got the temple got destroyed again in AD 70. AD 70 after Christ. But and that time, think of it, 
Like I said, that that the temple doesn't get destroyed ever for no reason. The the when it gets destroyed again in eighty seventy, it's because um, Jerusalem did not receive her Messiah. And and then in, in that um, sense too. Um, so what what was that time span of the second temple? Like four hundred years. Uh, second temple gets built. Well, that's where you have the seventy years, right? The the seventy years of dance of so four hundred ninety years. From the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah right, yeah, the 70 times seven, 70 weeks of Daniel. So it's the actually the 69 weeks, so 69 times 70. Um, that's that's how long all of that's happening. It's actually from that decree to when Jesus, uh, is in, is uh, some people will or argue that it's um, him coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, some people would say that it's at his baptism, so yeah. So that's kind of like that time period. And then from Jesus, 32, 33 AD, to the destruction of J Jerusalem Temple, that's when the New Testament is being written. And then maybe with the exception of Revelation, um, all those New Testament books were written before the destruction uh, in AD 70. But AD 70 becomes another one of those pivotal moments because ever since then, there's never been the old covenant. It's never been practiced after that. Old covenant was restored under Ezra and Nehemiah, and it was lost again under, um, uh, you know, in eighty seventy. And you've never had the daily sacrifices since, because the daily sacrifice has been replaced with the one-time sacrifice, Jesus. Yeah. So it's all, and Jesus predicted it. And, uh, um, yeah, so when you when you read like books like Hebrews or things that are written in between, uh, you know, Hebrews will say um, this, basically this covenant, which is passing away, um, you know, and every day they bring sacrifices, but Christ did. So this sacrifice is coming to an end. It's like they already know that Jesus is warned this temple isn't going to be standing here much longer. Um, the Christians knew that. So they're all, a lot of them are selling their property and, and getting out of Jerusalem. Uh, you remember the first painting you showed where it showed the odd looking pyramids? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw those today. Oh, they did you? Nubian. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You see this? Yeah, 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 is... yeah, yeah, yeah. The 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 really um the really um steep ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and there, that's in Sudan. In Sudan, yeah. Okay. Oh. Huh. But they were somebody saw them when they painted them. They right, them. right, they right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's funny because like you have these artists that will draw from like models or something that they have. But you know, like then all you know, you always have like this. Oh, like the Popian and the other one. Yeah, yeah, no, like they, like they, they all look here. They mix the time frames up like that. Yeah, okay. they mix the time frames up, you know, and then or or they paint themselves in the picture. You know, like uh, there's there's one there's one painting with like Mary, right, and she's wearing this thing, and it's like this old painting of Mary, but and of course the artist copied like what uh what was what was said there, and it's like and it says like it, you know. Allah Akbar, and it's yeah. like, and it's all like, you know, like God is great, and, and and Muhammad is his prophet, but like, you know, because they had gotten the the textile from from some Arabs or whatever, and then of course the the artist doesn't know what he's writing on there, you know, it's so like because he's a European guy, wow. <laughs> you know, so you got Mary with like this uh, with this uh, Muslim Islamic inscription uh, on her clothing or whatever. Oh so, no! <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah, you know, it's like what model you get. That's kind of like what you have to work with. And the, the artist <laughs> doesn't know any better. Yeah. <laughs> Once the temple was destroyed, then the Muslims came and built their. Oh no no okay, here's the thing. Um, it, after eighty seventy, yeah. there was like a lot of like um uh like the Romans didn't want anybody, and um and in fact. Um, it was, oh, yeah, I, the, um, the Muslims did, um, uh, go in there, like in the, in the, the wars or whatever, 
the Al-Aqsa Mosque, though, wasn't built until 700 something AD. This this creates a problem because, like, um, uh, according to uh, Muslims, you know, like Muhammad was brought into heaven from there. Yeah. Thing is, it wasn't even built and yeah. built at the time that he died. So there's a little bit of a time problem there. <laughs> it doesn't exactly work. If God didn't allow them to build there. So yeah, like yeah. Temple, well, yeah, there? right. Yeah. So so you have this uh and you have this section in like uh Revelation uh 17, I think, where it talks about, you know, go out and measure the temple and it's you know, but do not go into the outer courts because it's been handed to the Gentiles, basically. So there's there is a sense in which like um uh the temple is being kept away um and that's that's kind of like what you see in uh that's what i'm picking up like in in like revelation and stuff and it looks like that's why i'm i'm starting to warm up again to that gap theory that that seventh year is still in the future that 70th week i should say the 70th week is still in the future it's just going to be a seven year period um because um, it says they will the the Gentiles will trample it underfoot until um, you know basically uh, what I think would be the last week, right? So um, th that's that's um, I'm not a hundred percent sold on that, um, but it's looking the, the time of the Gentiles is kind of like a thing that like you can see it in the positive light and you can see it in the negative light. And um, in the positive light is, of course, that a fullness of the Gentiles is going to come in, right? Um, but Paul is predicting that there is going to be a mass salvation of Jewish people in the last days. And because, like, what, you know, like when they get grafted in again, what is it going to mean but the, um, but the salvation, uh, you know, of the world, basically? And... Um, and you know, I'm not going to go into that, but like I'm, I'm seeing kind of like more and more pieces kind of fit together where I'm thinking it's it's quite possible that, that we're looking at like a, a last week in the future. You know, I, I don't I don't think that it, le it legitimizes um, the old covenant ways again. But it, it and, and it actually what happens is that they finally accept the new covenant you know so um but there's still a, a plan definitely i think that for for god with the uh, with the, the nation of israel in the future so those are the heavy eschatological arguments you know eschatology so anyway uh let me um uh, you guys got any questions or observations, accusations, innuendos? <laughs> it's like we just time traveled. <laughs> What's that? It's like we just time traveled. Yeah, yeah, it's time travel, right? Yeah. You know, who'd have thought um, Daniel 11 would have like so much uh, in between the lines, you know? But it's it's pretty fascinating how you have such an exact history uh, that's that's laid out um that's laid out verse by verse there you yeah know, it's extraordinary it's like god was i'm in awe huh i'm in awe i'm in awe yeah 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 me too yeah <laughs> Well, I'll see you guys around this weekend. Um, I'll be All in right. touch on um, early next week. Um, I'll see if I have time to actually get um, a Bible study complete by next Thursday. Um, I don't have, I'm, I'm going through a training and I'm working all, all wow. this weekend and on Saturday. So I don't know how much time I have. And, and I got a lot of work to do in order to get uh, the next Bible study. Uh, mm -hmm. done but um we'll see all right well thank you very much you know all right we'll talk to you guys later yep. have a good one